Hi guys, just want to say happy 4th of July to all of you. Hope you have a good weekend. We're back with sessions 12 on pain assessment. Now there's a load of information on this topic and I probably have not even been able to cover everything, but you can go to dearnurses.com and learn more by reading pain assessment and pain management. Today we're going to talk about the pain scale assessment, management of the patient on a ventilator, cardiac and brain surgery patients, narcotic reaction, PC administration, and that drug that's been in the news lately, Diprovan, the other name for it is called Propofol. Now the first thing we're going to talk about is pain scale assessment. When you assess a patient for pain, I know there are there is more than one way to do it, but classically the one we use is that 0 to 10 assessment. And you know that pain goes from 0 to moderate, and even when we do those scales, when it gets down to the lower numbers, there's a point when you don't really have to medicate if, they, if it does not require. What's the most important is that you don't want to have to take care of a patient who is on, in pain, uncomfortable, but you also want to know how to assess and manage them so you don't overdo it. And of course you document whatever you give and you follow up by finding out if the medication you gave for pain was effective. Now the patient on ventilatory support, they are not always be able to communicate with you that they're having pain, but there are other ways you can find that out. If you take a look, you might find that the respirations increase, the blood pressure is very high, heart rate's up, and sometimes even the ventilator alarms start going off. So all of these are warning signs that you should pay attention to. Of course, we know that uh, a patient in pain who's uncomfortable and unable to communicate it is really miserable. We don't want to do that to patients. And of course, some of the other assessments we're going to talk about is like assessment of the patient who's having chest pain. Just take a look at this patient. He's having chest pain. I've tried to highlight the most important things. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and Jim is awakened with this terrible pain in his chest. It's so bad, he feels this intense pressure sitting in the middle of his chest. Now, one thing I want you to know that when people are having chest pain, of course, we've discussed this before, it should not be ignored. And in the, I have taken care of a patient who woke up with really bad chest pain. In his case, he's eaten a very rich meal and went to bed, and he did do a terrible amount of damage to his heart. Later on he had to have a bypass done. Something had gone wrong. But anyway, you need to look at things like, uh, what, uh, ask them, are they having pressure in the chest? Is it radiating to the jaw, to the shoulder, to the fingers? All of these are indications that it might be heart involvement. And of course you rate the pain on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, not many of you, or many of you may have, I don't know, taken care of a patient who's had like a tumor resection. The problem with these patients is not just about medicating them for pain. Many of them will tell you that when they've had visitors who've stayed at the bedside for a long time and their brains have been overstimulated, that the pain medication does not as effective. And what I found in taking care of these patients is when you medicate them for pain, if you advise them to take a rest along with it, they do a lot better because I've seen them where you can practically give them everything that's ordered and they have no pain relief. Then they become very nauseated and agitated and that is because they are lacking the most important thing, rest. It's not just about giving a pain shot. So here we see this poor nurse administering pain medication, but she never took the trouble to tell the family to let this patient rest. Um, I worked when patients would come out of surgery right after they had the surgical procedure done for the brain, tumor resection or wherever it was, and families generally swarm because they all want to know that this patient is doing so well. And many of them would stay around the bedside and it was like a party until these people were screaming for their heads and that's not what you want. It's about making that patient comfortable. So it's very important to let the family know that rest is best even after something for pain. Of course we're going to talk a little more about uh, narcotic reactions. We all know narcotics are given very freely, freely in the sense that they're ordered by the doctor, we don't just give them. 
But what's important to know that sometimes we do have problems, like take the case of this elderly gentleman. And when a patient is older, he has the potential for stuff staying in the system a long time. We don't know his, the condition of his kidneys, whether it can eliminate everything, his liver. There's a lot more involvement than just about giving pain medication. So take the case of this patient. He was given a milligram of Ativan. It was ordered by the doctor. Now he's very lethargic. His respirations are very shallow. His nurse is having trouble waking him up, and this is kind of frightening, but yes, it can happen. So you need to pay close attention when you medicate patients to do a follow-up and see how it's affected that patient, especially narcotics. It can affect things like respirations and the neurological status of that patient. And of course, if it happens, you need to document it and notify the MD. Then in the second situation here, we have this poor lady. She swears she's seeing all this little people dancing around. And you know what? People do get reactions to narcotics, even when it's done correctly, given by the five rights. Oh, yes, it can happen. People can have hallucinations. There was somebody who told the story um, right after she was given a medication for pain. She saw people coming like in a coffin to take her away. So it does happen, and you need to pay attention. If somebody says to you that they're hallucinating after having medication, that you should not just ignore it and say, I don't believe that's true. So we're going to go on a little bit more to discuss about PCA, which is considered to be patient control analgesia. What happens when patient control analgesia is given um, Typically what happens is the doctor orders it and then the machine is set up by trained personnel. It's set up and everything is ready to go. There is a pain button, as you know, which the patient is allowed to press. And the reason I stress the patient, because who's going to know who's having the pain? A family member walks in and presses that button. Does she know if that patient is really in pain? Now, there is also what is often given is called a basal and what happens with a basal is this there's like a continuous low flow of medication which is given now when the bolus is given the patient pushes that button and that's the bolus but if a patient is on a basal you need to pay close attention and make sure that that patient does not get to the point where they become too tired and if you like in the case of number one this patient is saying Jan please open your eyes this patient is on a PCA pump but she's not responding so we don't know if she was on a basal that's causing the problem. You need to pay close attention when people are on PCA that everything is done right. You've done patient education. You've followed the doctor's instructions because these things can be overlooked. And Of course, you document when you find your patient. I once had a patient on a PCA. I, at shift change, I came in and she was hardly responding. I had to call the doctor and get him to stop it because what had happened was the family was always complaining that she was in pain when she was at home and whatever basal she was on, she could not tolerate it. So you need to pay close attention. Now this has been in the news a lot lately, Diproban, Propofol. And I don't know if every nurse is familiar with Propofol. It's used in general anesthesia. And it's also used when I worked in intensive care we used to have quite a few patients on propofol, but there are criteria. It's not just given at any old place. One of the things is ventilatory support. Once a patient is given propofol, their respirations are probably going to become very depressed, and they're not going to be able to breathe very well on their own. Typically, they're on a ventilator when they're given propofol. You have to monitor their vital signs, their respirations, their neurological status, their oxygen saturation. And looking at it, you cannot see it here, but it just comes up in a really white color, almost like milk. And it does have like a very fat base. So if you have a patient on propofol, you have to pay close attention to see how that patient is doing. Not just the relief of pain, but their neurological status and their respiratory status also. Now I urge you, if you want to learn a little bit more about pain and its management to take a look at dearnurses.com. There is also another topic which might be of uh, use to you and that would be the, the one on assessment. There are many different topics there on assessment at dearnurses.com which would be of help to you. So have a great weekend. Again, it's July the 4th and God bless you all. Stay posted for more clinical issues coming soon.